What up, it's your boy T-Bear here with the reaction today. It's Films Friday. Now it's time for the meat and potatoes of Films Friday. It took a little long to do it because I had to cook dinner or anything for, for the wife. That's yes, what can cook some time. Well, some Hello Fresh though. Shout out to as well too. Shout out to Dead Meat. But anyway, as I said, sorry, got no. So I asked, asked, wish, asked if I should continue with going on with wrong turn for as promised, as promised before because you know next week it will be the, the um next poll results so but day to day came out too so from the looks of the poll people said to keep on going with wrong term as the plan reaction so i will do that so continue on with the wrong term franchise we're going to get up to wrong turn four you know i kind of caught the kills for the last two in the remake on golden Golden Chainsaw and Dolph Machete. I'm still going to react to these regardless, though. Um, so, while for the do, let's check out Wrong Turn 2. No, Wrong Turn 2. Wrong Turn 4. And I was hesitant on doing these because a lot of people say, even James and James and Lee say that it gets a little bad down the line. So, let's get it. Oh, I will be probably porcelain in tear because I got SmackDown on. So, yeah. Welcome to the Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, hey, James. and today we're looking at Wrong Turn 4 Bloody Beginnings, released direct to DVD in 2011. As the name implies, Wrong Turn 4 is a prequel to the franchise, Ooh. meaning even though Three Finger died in part 3, we can still have him running around in this oh. one. What's more, we can even bring back One Eye and Sawtooth, the OG mutant cannibals who were killed by Detective Quinn in the first film. Don't that feel good? I knew that it would now. But if you're sitting there excited about some Return to Roots movie that's more like the original, you should just hold your goddamn horses, partner. Because this one's just as torture porny, and, you know, porny, as part three. That's probably because it was once again directed by Declan O'Brien, who also took over screenwriting duties for this installment. His script, which he shot in just 19 days, features a whole bunch of characters who wow. couldn't care less about getting butchered and eaten by mm. three cannibals we know will survive, which is always a huge downside when making a horror prequel. At least it's set in the winter, I guess. I always like snow-filled horror films, maybe just because they're relatively rare. By this point, everyone knows what kind of movies these are, including actor Caitlin Lieb here. Wrong turn movies are disgusting and people love to see blood and gore. And because that's the case, I got another sponsor so I could include all the good stuff in this video. Manscaped offers the tools you need to keep your tool nice and clean. They're perfect package 3.0 uh, did his the uh, 3.0 electric trimmer as well as the crop preserver ball deodorant yeah that's ball a thing deodorant. it's actually pretty great also great is the fact that manscaped now ships to australia and canada which by the way is where this movie was filmed up in winnipeg how's that for integration mm. you can get 20 percent off and free shipping by using promo code dead meat at manscaped.com again use promo code dead meat at manscaped.com for 20 percent off and free shipping to the US, Australia, and Canada. Try it today. Your balls will thank you. Now let's see how many sex crazed college students get put on ice in this prequel and get to the kills. The movie begins at the Glenville Sanatorium in 1974, where the staff does a poor job hiding upcoming plot devices. Of course, we can open all the cells at once. Uh, sorry. I'm like focused on what's going on, getting ready, getting out the way. I, I, I didn't do this right. I'm sorry. I ain't going, I ain't going to surprise you from there. Thank you. Now let's see how many sex crazed college students get put on ice in this prequel and get to the kills. The movie begins at the yep. <laughs> Glenville Sanatorium in 1974, where the staff does a poor job hiding upcoming plot devices. Of course, we could open all the cells at once in case of fire, but the protocol is one cell open at a time. Dr. Brendan Ryan is showing Dr. Anne-Marie McQuaid around the sanatorium's danger zone, Ooh. where their most unruly patients are kept locked up like prisoners. You know, patients like our beloved, but not really, mutant cannibals. In backstory that nobody ever asked for, we learn that our conniving 
hunting cannibals are known as the Hilliker brothers. Mm. Little boy Three Finger, who mm. chewed off his other fingers. Uh. We never found them. We think he ate them. Middle boy One Eye, who ate his other eyeball Ew. after stabbing it out with a fork. And big boy Sawtooth, who has to wear a mask because of his self-sharpened teeth. Oh, and one more thing about these fellers? They can't feel pain. Dr. Ryan says their total analgesia is because of a rare condition caused by their inbred lineage. Again, I don't think any of this was necessary to explain for mutant mountain cannibal killers, but obviously, writer-director Declan O'Brien disagreed. We've never heard the story of the three boys, Sawtooth, One-Eye, and Three-Finger. Where'd they come from? So we're doing kind of an origination story? After the docs leave, the, the cannibals use a hairpin from the ground to crack open their cell door. Freedom! Now they can go pinch a loaf and or kill people. I'll let you guess what they choose. Their first victim is an orderly who they tackle to the ground. Mm. They bite him around the neck area and stab him in the eye, Ooh. which is just the funniest goddamn thing to Three Finger. <laughs> <laughs> he fucking loves his job, that little guy mm. does. Now get a good taste of victory Ew. there, buddy. Uh, by the way, that orderly who just got killed was played by Scott Johnson, a stunt performer from Winnipeg who mm. also plays adult Sawtooth oh. throughout the rest of this movie. The cannibals hit that fire purge button, which sets off a scene of generic mm. mental asylum mayhem, scored to Blue Danube for extra cliche points. <laughs> If it ain't the shunting, I don't want to hear that music in a horror movie. <laughs> I don't see any confirmed kills in all this commotion, but the Hilliker brothers make sure to target Dr. Oh. McQuaid and kill her with extended and extensive Ooh. electroshocks to the dome, frying her brain tank until she's foaming out the mouth Ooh. and smoking! Next, they go after Chief of Staff Dr. Ryan, wrapping barbed wire around his limbs and tying it to a bunch of gears. They pull him apart Ooh. until his limbs start to tear from his torso one by one, with very graphic close-ups of the arms and legs ripping. Sick nasty stuff. Dr. Ryan dies in the franchise's most saw-like kill to date, completely quartered by a simple machine. Ew. It did not surprise me to find out that this movie's kills were what Declan O'Brien gave most of his attention to. Writing a script like this mm. is really difficult because you gotta think of new ways to kill people. Yeah, and also good characters in a story, but I guess he didn't make it that far. Damn. Now it's 2003, same year the first movie came out, and we're at Weston University. But it might as well be Dare Dorm, given how graphic the double sex scene here is. I can't even begin to show footage of it, because it's more porny than the porn camp from part 3. But it does show us that characters Vincent and Jenna are a couple, as are Sarah and Bridget. Great! These four horn dogs are part of a group of college friends taking wow, off for a hey. winter cabin camping trip. And boy, do they laugh at the dumbest fucking shit. Sorry, we're late. Daniel's fault. <laughs> the roads were bad. <laughs> Wait, why was that funny? He said the roads were bad. That made you all laugh like that? <laughs> <laughs> Rough script ahead, y'all. You drive like a girl. I want to go fast. <laughs> Thanks. Real rough. Yep, these characters blow hard. They're the type of people to make fun of that Daniel guy for double checking that their cars are safe and for wearing a helmet on a snowmobile. Just a bunch of mean nothing characters who are supposed to be super cool kids. Which is probably my least favorite kind of character writing. I just hate watching people like this, no matter how much they name drop the franchise's title. It's making the wrong turn, I know it. They get lost in a snowstorm on their way to their friend Porter's cabin, which forces them to seek shelter at a building they see nearby. It's the sanatorium we saw in the cold open, and the nine oh. college students are grateful to find it inviting and warm. Warmer than it should be, given that it's a supposedly abandoned building. And would you look at that? Since they're in the middle of nowhere, their phones have... <laughs> no signal. The Glenville Sanatorium was played by the Brandon Mental Health Center in Brandon, Manitoba, which was originally built in 1890 and functioned as an asylum for a hundred years before closing in the 1990s. Production designer Rajon Labrie found the location, which is the best thing this movie has going for it. You can tell it's a real place that has some real history to it. The location is sensational. I mean, talk about a uh, stimulus that enables you to get into a tone or a mood or a feel that is relevant to the film. You'll be missing real locations when we get to part five. The group gets a fire going, and oversized scene kid Kyle apologizes for getting them lost. It's all good, dude. Now y'all can explore this abandoned hospital. 
trespassing? Hey, get a load of Mr. Orange over there, wanting to follow laws and shit, nerd. I really don't know why everyone in this movie hates Daniel so much, but I do know that actor Dean Armstrong was previously on the kill count in Saw 3D. Oh, he was Cal, shit. the guy who helped Bobby Dagan fake his survivor's oh. tail and then died in a yeah, see no evil it. trap. A group of the kids go off with torches and flashlights, which in some places are the same thing, and find Dr. Ryan's office, where the guys can keep talking about sex. Had you, uh, masturbated yet? Ew! <laughs> sex is really? cool. Like, booze. Booze is cool. Daniel finds the files mm -hmm. on the Hilliker brothers and takes them as Ooh. reading material, not knowing that he could just ask any questions to the cannibals themselves, since they're rolling up to their hospital home with the very fake body of Porter, the cabin-owning friend the others were on their way to see. Oh, After some shit. insufferable group scenes full of bad dialogue and forced giggling, <laughs> Vincent leaves to find a generator. Not sure why he starts talking about his family's digestive issues, though. We got gas. Eh, maybe he just had to let it out. After he gets the lights going, the kids have a music-backed montage of drinking and debauchery, not knowing that they're being watched by a one-eyed mutant who just can't believe how easy it's about to be to eat all these idiots. No, one-eye. I can't believe it either. Mm. They wind up wheelchairing into an auditorium where they find a film reel they decide to play. Oh, shit. Look at that projector. Bagul would cream his suit pants over it. The film features a top build performance by One Eye, I think, and a doctor played by Declan O'Brien himself. The images make Lauren here remember the tales her brother used to tell her about the mutant hillbillies who roamed around these parts. So they ate each other. <laughs> Cannibals. Are you serious? That's bullshit. Lauren's played by Ali Tatarin, one of this movie's many Canadian actors, who was last seen on the kill count in Cult of Chucky as okay. Nurse Ashley, who got drilled through the mm. stomach off screen. She was also briefly seen tied up in the beginning of the Silent Night remake, where she was also uh. killed off screen. Night comes, which sends everyone off to bed so they can sleep and or have gratuitous lesbian mm. sex with the door wide open so dudes can watch. Jesus, this fucking movie. Vince Vincent's walking around exploring when he finds Porter's body in the nurse's station. Dude, are you asleep? No, man, the guy is clearly dead. Just like you! Sawtooth sticks oh! a needle all up inside Vincent's nose, <laughs> killing him as some inappropriately Woo! somber music plays. Woo! What the fuck is that score? This was an Shit. idiot slasher victim, not the dad in a quiet place. Come on. <laughs> I did find it interesting, though, that the guy playing Vincent, Sean Skeen, also plays adult three-finger in another instance of dual roles in this movie. Skeen's primarily a stunt performer, as is his brother Dan, who was right alongside him playing adult one-eye. They seem to have a lot of fun on set, as did everyone else. Once again, even though I think this movie is total ass, I commend Dr. O'Brien for running a fun set, at least according to producer Kim Todd. The key is that the director and the producer Damn. and all the department heads inspire the crew to have fun, to collaborate, to look at things sort of out of the box. How can we do it for what we've got, that's, for the resources That's probably why have. him and the uh, doctor do got killed easily in first. the 19 days we have and so then get the, to, to go and do the sure rest of the roles fun all the way through well, Jenna wakes DJ? up in a nasty hospital bed the next morning to find Vincent missing which leads to an entirely pointless 90 second one take shot where she asks all these nothing characters if they've seen him they split up to find him and prove themselves to be very inadequate forensic examiners when they mm. find what may be his blood I mean he he, he could have cut himself on something. I'm sure that's exactly what happened, Daniel. In the kitchen, Jenna sees Sawtooth walking in with Porter's body. She hides and watches as the cannibal gets to work cutting up her friend, tossing parts all over and getting a full decapitation in for good measure. Properly disgusted, she runs out of the kitchen and delivers the news to her friends. They're gonna kill us all! She's probably right, y'all. It's hard to get a more threatening message than your friend's head wrapped up in his jacket. A razor noose slips around Claire's oh, neck come and here. the characteristicless character up go into the air. As Claire is killed, Ooh. she bleeds out all over her boyfriend Kyle's face, who should probably keep his mouth shut right now. Look at all that blood, dude. You don't want that in your mouth. The blood drips all over the camera lens, too, because Claire is just spitting and dripping all over the place here. Her kill is completed when her head pops off like a balloon and Ooh. falls to the ground. I do like Kyle's POV shot as he sees both the spurty body and the severed head. That'll scar ya. With their snowmobile
snowmobile sabotage, the kids are stuck here, smack dab in the middle of a snowstorm. Wrong Turn 4 was shot in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and the weather conditions proved to be quite difficult for the cast and crew. I mean, it literally is the coldest place I've ever been to. Reported temperatures varied from negative 20 to negative 30 to as low as negative 48 with wind chill. But as someone who moved to LA to get away from winters like that, I'm not interested in any temperatures that begin with the word negative. The kids don't like the cold either, but since Lauren ain't about to fuck around with mutant cannibals, she puts on her snow gear and her big girl shoes, which are attached to skis, and sets out cross-country skiing to find- She about to die. With the weather outside so frozen, Rightful, and the mutant cannibal so biteful, the kids bar themselves inside Dr. Ryan's office and make puns about what's happened to their dead friends. Fuck, they probably turned Porter into Porter House by now. I mean, he ain't wrong. These cannibals are cooking up a storm. Remembering an equipment shed they found earlier, which had tools they could use to defend themselves, another splintering occurs, with Kyle, Sarah, and Daniel leaving, while Jenna, Kenya, and Bridget stay locked inside the office. After getting to the cage and finding all sorts of weapons for themselves, the foragers are returning when Daniel gets ambushed. Huh, Kyle gotcha. and Sarah don't realize gotcha. that Daniel's gone until they're back in the office and they hear him screaming from somewhere yonder. His friends sit there and deliberate with more shitty dialogue. Listen! We have to have a plan if we're gonna get out of here alive, and I have one. As Daniel gets prepped oh, by the cannibals shit. for consumption. Why are you sticking that knife Ooh. in him so early, guys? He's clearly not done yet. Oh, they're not baking him. They're just slicing off his pack. Holy oh, damn. Oh, that is one special trim right there. After an argument that includes a friggin' boat, his friends finally decide to go rescue Daniel. Jesus, just Took get there enough. already, folks. This guy's literally Ugh. having his skin ripped off. He probably just wants to die. Let me die. Thought so. Kyle runs ahead of the others and gets to the kitchen where he sees what the cannibals are doing to Daniel. Namely, more hefty skin peel. Oh, God, this cannibalistic the skin in already. After Dean Armstrong had to undergo a full body mold so the makeup artist could create pre sliced bits of him that would come off with a knife. Armstrong simply popped his head out from beneath a table and his entire body that we're watching get cut up was a fake one made with that mold. In the most clever twist on cannibalism I've ever seen, the Hillikers begin to eat Daniel's flesh like fondue. Yeah, normally I could take or leave people eating, but the fondue bit, that's A-OK -okay with me. Kyle runs off to tell the girls what he saw. They're eating him alive like some fucked up fondue. Not sticking around long enough to see Daniel get his wish and die. All it took in the end was the forceful removal of one of his organs. What is that, the liver? Yeah, three finger, liver alone. The cannibals are in the middle of a Three Stooges gag. <laughs> when the kids attack them, they chase mm. the Hillikers with blades and fire all the way back to their old cell, then slam the door shut and lock them inside. Almost everyone wants to murder the brothers, with Kyle dousing them in kerosene. Hold a second, go hold a second, be right back. I'm back. A does have one something to put it on, but going Let's get so back to far it. as to light a zippo. But Kenya's against it and says they shouldn't stoop to the cannibals' level. Pretty sure you're good as long as you don't eat them, Kenya. Kyle acquiesces, much to Bridget's dismay, and they decide to leave the cannibals locked up and yell at them during a sudden relapse of puberty. Where are the spark plug wires? As Kyle settles in to watch over the cannibals, the ladies go off and look for the snowmobile spark plug wires. Too bad Kyle's all tuckered out though, and after he falls asleep, Three Finger uses the same hairpin from all those years ago to pick the cell lock once more. The not great looking cannibals grab their captor by the Ooh. neck and knock him out. Since this prequel brought back one eye and sawtooth, O'Brien told makeup artists like Doug Morrow that he wanted the mutants to look just like they did in the first movie. I don't think they quite fulfilled that goal, but to be fair, they only had two weeks to prepare the makeup design, oh, wow. which involved five piece prosthetics that were applied to the Skeen brothers and Scott Johnson every morning. At the end of each day, they were able to just peel off and throw away the fake faces. Which reminds me of the time I was Pennywise mm. and had to peel all that
that latex off my head. The generator dies, turning off all the lights, and after Kenya sees the empty cell, she and the others barricade themselves inside the office again. A stumbling figure in a mask makes its way over and peekaboos, and Kenya says that it's Three Finger. Pick the small one! Is it Kenya? Cause that dude looks 6'2 at least. It's a tragedy waiting to happen, as the ladies agree to go out and kill who they assume to be a defenseless mutant. It's they the, pounce on him in the hallway and stab him all to hell. It's the boy. Just really getting into it. Uh, like it's that dude. For a murderous cult or something. And of course, the dude ends up being Nick caught. Kyle, he I was figured. unable to say anything because he had had his tongue cut out. Uh, the prankster people eaters come out to attack the ladies, who run through the hospital until they wind up in the attic, which apparently is where the mutants have been living. They take the winter clothes they find and head back downstairs, mm. where they rip out a rusted grate from a window and bust their way straight into an ice carving competition. With the cannibals knocking to get in through their barricaded door, Sarah digs a snow tunnel until she pops out the other side. To freedom! Bridget climbs through next, followed by Kenya, who escapes right as Sawtooth breaks down the door. That means it's too late for Jenna to get through the tunnel, and she gets drilled Ooh. through the back by Sawtooth, using a giant screwy drill bit, which gets blood all over Kenya's face. Also, just wanted to share this shot of the neat practical effects used here. Props to this movie's huge crew of makeup artists, including key effects assistant Mike Hamilton and special effects coordinator Cameron Patterson. The remaining trio of ladies make their way through the snow on foot as the Hilliker brothers take things to the extreme and chase after them on their snowmobiles. Oh, they do doing formations and shit. The cannibals scoop up Bridget and knock down Kenya, who's not a doctor, but still knows how to use the ouch scale. How bad is it? I don't know. It fucking hurts. Bridget tries to fight back a bit, but winds up getting killed by one eye as he runs the vehicle's belt all over her body. Oh. Now bounce with it, one eye. Bounce with it. He does. Until Bridget's turned into a red mist spraying out the back of the snowmobile. As the sun comes up, we learn that Lauren's dead. Remember her? Mm. She left to go get help I'll way figure. back when. She did have a single scene since then that showed her fire being snuffed out by snow, and now actor Allie Tattery continues her off-screen death streak she on just, the kill count. She's just sitting there too, Since it looks like she almost made it to a road before she died. She's just sitting there chilling. Kenya is making her way across the frozen expanse when one eye tries to roll up on her. But turns out this was a trap that lets Sarah knock him out the box with a branch. Kenya and Sarah saddle up on the snowmobile and take off into the sunrise, giggling that they're finally okay. <laughs> Oh, shit, dude. Wow. That, uh, holy shit. That actually took me by surprise. That little oh no they said was tragic. I'm a bit bummed out that these last two characters died, but I'll admit that this ending affected me. Hell, I'm even kind of into the Blackout City Kids song, Wrong Turn, playing as Three Finger casually cleans up. Wishing they could start again somewhere I know so it's on the... I know so it's on the go to the chainsaw, but still... Jesus. Still, overall, one shitty fucking movie, man. Not How many people got survivor. killed by cannibals who we knew would survive the movie? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Other than the cannibals, of course. Oh, it's still a little bit left on it. 13 people died in Wrong Turn 4, and with 6 dudes and 7 ladies getting killed, it gave us the rare occurrence of more female victims. Hold up, go back. You see that the one, he got the, the one that throws the death into a blue one, really? <laughs> and with six dudes and seven ladies mm -hmm. getting killed, it gave us the rare occurrence of more female victims. That is with a rare. time of 93 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 7.15 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill, honestly, to Kenya and Sarah, which director Declan O'Brien also seemed to enjoy. <laughs> I know there were gorier kills, but none of them affected my emotions as much as that tragic little obviously dubbed oh no. Oh no! I still don't know if I like the fact that they died, but the shot afterwards of the bodies slumping off the snowmobile is probably the best shot in the whole movie. Dull machete for lamest kill will go to Bridget, because boy did that blood spray look bad. And that's it. Wrong Turn 4 Bloody Beginnings came out direct to video in 2011. 
I know last week I said it was marginally better than Wrong Turn 3, but now I'm not so sure. They're both just so bad. Yeah, we definitely should make another one. But Declan O'Brien's gonna keep this franchise going. So next week we'll look at part five. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Well, I mean, act kill wise was good. Acting wise, yeah, it was pretty bad. So yeah, other than that, uh, next one will be the winner of the poll I put up as well too. Then after that, possibly to be dead, de uh, day to dead, or or possibly um, one turn five to get it out the way. So other than that, if you like my reaction, like, share, subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's your boy T Bear signing off. One love.